is meant to bring to uh, JBU and Siloam Springs communities topics in science and mathematics that we can all understand and appreciate. Our aim for these uh, is for them to be fascinating, thoughtful, and distinctively Christian discussions. Uh, let's start with a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this, uh, this opportunity. We thank you so much for the safe travel uh, that Dr. Benema has uh, experienced so far. We just pray that uh, this would be a great experience for all of us tonight and that you would uh, take him back home safely uh, at the end of our time. We just pray, Father, for uh, clear thinking tonight. We just pray uh, for Dr. Benema that you would just give him um, your thoughts and your words to speak to us tonight, and we'll give you the praise and glory for that. In your name we pray, amen. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank uh, JVU's Fuse organization for helping with tonight's event. Uh, Fuse's mission is to provide a safe environment for students. Uh, understandings can be challenged in the exploration of the nature of science and religion and their mutual interactions. To foster continued interest and discussion in the JVU community about topics related to faith and science and to be a part of providing the greater Christian community with individuals who can discuss science as it relates to faith with greater intelligence and humility. Tonight's speaker has journeyed far to be with us this evening. Dr. Dennis Venema uh, is a professor of biology at Trinity Western University in Langley, uh, excuse me, Langley British Columbia. Uh, Dr. Venema and I go way back. Uh, we're friends, what, maybe 15 minutes or so? Maybe even 20. Maybe even 20, okay. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science uh, with honors from the University of British Columbia uh, and received his PhD from the University of British Columbia in, in 2003. His research is focused on the genetics of pattern formation and signaling using uh, the common fruit fly, Drosophila melangastra, as a model organism. Dr. Venema is the recipient of the 2008 College Biology Teaching Award from the National Association of Biology Teachers. He and his family enjoy numerous outdoor activities that the, uh, along the Canadian uh, Pacific Coast region. He is a regular contributor to the BioLogos Forum with a focus on the biological evidence for evolution. His recently published book is Adam and the Genome, Reading Scripture After Genetic Science, uh, which he co-authored with Scott McKnight. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome uh, to the podium Dr. Venema. So I titled my talk tonight, Evidence for an Evolving Creation, which probably lets you know where I'm coming from right from the get -go. So you don't have to wait for the end to figure out where, where I'm going to on the topic. One of the things as I teach undergraduates in our science program at Trinity Western, one of the things that we discuss as uh, faculty with our students is this question of, is science an appropriate activity for Christians? And those of you that are historians or have some appreciation of history will know that for many, many years in uh, Renaissance Europe and Enlightenment Europe, that being a Christian and being a scientist went together extremely well. They were thought to be highly complementary activities. Here's a Reformed theologian with, with his take on it, Abraham Piper, who said there's not a square inch, it's a very famous quote, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our existence over which Christ is not sovereign. So, of course, that includes both the natural world as well as um, the, the supernatural. Here's another very famous quote from Francis Bacon who says, Let no man, or we would say, let no one, let no man or woman think or maintain that someone can search too far or be too well studied in the book of God's word or the book of God's work. So this is a very famous metaphor, sometimes called the two books metaphor, whereby as Christians, we hold that God is both the author of God is the author of all of creation, and God is the author of special revelation to us in the form of scripture and in the person of Jesus Christ, and also God is the author of creation, general revelation. And because God is the author of both, the Christians hold as a matter of conviction that there can't be any, any inherent conflict between those two sources of revelation, because God is the author of both of them. Now, unfortunately, well, maybe not unfortunately, God has given us methods by which we appropriate and interpret these two forms of revelation that he has given to us. 
So with special revelation, we use exegesis and hermeneutics to attempt to understand the scriptures and to apply them to our own lives. And God is, I also view science as a God-given activity whereby God allows us to use our God-given capabilities to investigate the natural world. Now, these are human endeavors, and as such, they're not perfect. So it's possible, sometimes we might even say even likely, that there might be apparent conflicts. That in our study of exegesis and our study of the scientific method, we may come to things that we think of, don't, you know, we're, we're not quite sure how they go together. But we can rest in the confidence that these conflicts are apparent only, and that further work, perhaps on the exegesis side, perhaps on the scientific side, should in principle be able to resolve these. Perhaps not in this lifetime, perhaps we'll have to wait to, be, to the eschaton for that, but for, for a final understanding of how it all fits together. But as Christians, we have this confidence that God is the author of both sources of revelation. So a statement I'll put to you here is to say, despite the possibility of apparent conflict between science and scripture, both are sources of God's revelation, and Christians are not well served by denigrating either, because both of them are God-given means to understand what he would like to communicate to us. Here's something that, a statement that my own institution makes on this particular point, again, using this two books metaphor. A biblical view of creation does not constrain legitimate scientific inquiry and research because we accept two sources of information, biblical revelation and natural revelation. Now, if only it were that simple, right? Okay, we all the the problem, right? All works together wonderfully. One of the things that I sometimes say to my students is, and we get to live in a time when it seems like there might be an apparent conflict. We haven't had a, a situation like this in the church for about 400 years. We've been through this before, about 400 years ago, with the whole heliocentrism versus geocentrism discussion. And I say to my students, you know, lucky you, you get to live through a time when this is actually happening. They say, I don't want to live through it. Fast forward 400 years and tell me how it all works out. Okay. So one thing I would like to say then is to say that well-supported conclusions of science then, though not perfect, because science is a human activity, just like exegesis and hermeneutics is, well-supported conclusions of science, then, are a witness to God's natural revelation, and Christians should take them seriously. Let's think briefly just what we mean by this word theory. And the reason for discussing this just briefly is because what theory means in science is often different from what we think about sort of in common, everyday language. So in science, a theory is an explanatory framework that's withstood repeated experimentation, it continues to produce hypotheses about the natural world, and it makes testable predictions. You can make hypotheses with it and go up and test them. In everyday usage, theory means something quite different, more like guess or conjecture. So if you're on social media and somebody says, well, that's your theory, you know, on Facebook or something like that, they're not saying, well, that's your well-supported explanatory framework that makes, no, they're saying that's your guess, that's your conjecture. So it's unfortunate that this word that scientists use the colloquial meaning of it is almost diametrically opposed to the actual meaning that scientists use. So another way to put this is to say, if something is only a theory, that's actually quite high praise from the scientific viewpoint. Okay, I put this cartoon up just to sort of soften the blow of this next statement. Maybe goldfish crackers are going to their origin as well. I'm not sure if they were not. But just to say, despite what you may have been told as a Christian, Evolution is a theory in that scientific sense, not in that colloquial sense. It's a well-tested explanatory framework. It's supported by a huge body of experimental evidence. We've had evolution as a productive scientific theory since the time of Darwin, so for about 150 years. It makes accurate predictions. And we have not yet rejected this idea, rejected this hypothesis. So one of the things that science, one of the ways science works is that science always holds its theories as provisional. So even if it's a well-tested explanatory framework, it's making you know, boringly accurate predictions that you can test um, successfully in the natural world, scientists always hold theories with an open hand. We, are all, we never accept a hypothesis, as it were. Scientists talk about failing to reject a hypothesis, and it's an important distinction. If we accepted a hypothesis, then we might say, well, no more work is needed, we're satisfied with that answer, we've now arrived at truth in some philosophical sense. What a scientist says is, no, we've failed to reject this hypothesis, and we've failed to reject it despite repeated experimentations. That's why we call it a theory. But we still hold that it's provisional in some sense, and that new information might come along that would 
cause us to revise our ideas. Now, some theories in science are so well supported that it's extremely unlikely that new information will cause us to radically rethink those. The scientists always hold them with an open hand. Evolution also happens to be the most foundational theory in biology. This is a very famous quote that some of the biologists in the room will recognize from the Orthodox Christian um, population genesis, where he says, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. I sometimes tell my students in biology, everything that you're studying, genetics, cell biology, is actually part of evolutionary theory. If you ask the question why, excuse me, often enough in biology, eventually you have to use some sort of evolutionary explanation by the time you sort of drill down far enough. So evolution kind of lurks at the bottom of all of biology. So as, as, as such, I say to my students, you know, you can't be a biology major without learning about evolution. Even if one doesn't theologically agree with it, that's fine. But you certainly at least need to know what it is as a theory, because you won't understand biology properly unless you have an appreciation of it. Okay, so that brings us to, to start talking about what sort of lines of evidence are there for evolution. Like I said, we've had evolution as a productive scientific theory for 150 years, so I could bore the socks off everyone in this room by just giving a litany of all sorts of different lines of evidence for it. Darwin, when he first came up with this idea, well, he wasn't the very first to think about common ancestry, but Darwin, was, his claim to fame was that he thought of a, a hypothesis for the mechanism that natural selection might actually shift, shift the average characteristics of populations. So, but there was a time when Darwin had an idea. So at that point, it was a hypothesis. Hadn't yet sort of worked its way through the theory. Darwin's hypothesis that species share common ancestors, there's actually a very famous image from our figure that Darwin drew in one of his notebooks. It's one of the very first evolutionary trees. It's a little branching tree of species. And, right, and next to that, in his notebook, Darwin wrote, I think. That was his idea. That's when evolution was a hypothesis. So Darwin's hypothesis was this, that current species in the present day share common ancestral populations in the past. His idea was that populations become separated genetically. Now Darwin didn't understand how genetics work, works, <coughs> me. but we have a better appreciation of that now. Genetic changes, if populations become separated, this means that genetic changes in each of those populations are now not averaged across those two populations. So any differences that accumulate in one population versus another are now not being shared. This means that differences can accumulate in average characteristics as average characteristics of those populations might change. These differences might lead to new species over time. No guarantee that it would. This is actually very much like how human languages form. In the, the book that was mentioned that I just published recently with Scott McKnight, I take a significant chunk of one of the chapters and discuss how language change over time is actually a very good analogy for how species form over time. It's something that we're more familiar with, and we know that it happens at a population level. So you can have a population that's, oops, that speaks a common ancestral language. Those populations might become separated, meaning that language changes syntax, spelling, and so on, are no longer being averaged across those two populations. Differences accumulate, average characteristics might change, and these differences might lead to new languages over time if the two populations remain separate for long enough. So both species and languages are information systems, but they're copied imperfectly. And as a result, we have this incremental process of change. And actually, as Christians, we're well positioned to understand this because we're familiar with language change over time because we read different Bible translations from different eras. So if I put this here and allow you to read it, this is a Bible verse. It doesn't make much sense to us, does it? Did you know that that's English? Well, that's actually Anglo-Saxon from the year about 990. And this is John 129. I like it because it's got Middle Earth in it. <laughs> Not just insulting. This is 1395, the Wycliffe Bible, which is a little bit more accessible to us. Here's the Tyndale New Testament in 1525. Here's the original King James of 1611. One of the ironies, of course, is that the King James only movement doesn't use the original King James of 1611, they actually use the Cambridge edition of the King James, not the King James, which are from the 1800s, which would, you would be more familiar with if you'd read the King James as a kid. You would have been reading one of the Cambridge editions. 
And then a modern translation which reads naturally for us. Now, it's not the case that you know, one day in 1394, everybody sat down and said, you know, we've been saying it this way for 400 years. It's time to change. Okay, let's get a little bit of change. What we're looking at, of course, are snapshots. You can sort of think the fossil record. Let me think about this. You're looking at snapshots drawn from what we understand to be a continuous process. Now, here's the interesting thing. Every generation spoke the same language as their parents and as their offspring. But yet, over time, we see these incremental changes which accumulate, which can lead to large-scale differences. And it's the same idea with species. Every species is the same species as the generation that preceded it and the generation that followed it. But incremental change can accumulate over large spans of time, such that you can end up with fairly marked differences. So this is change within a lineage. We could also talk about languages separating and becoming different. So, we could think of very recent examples like Brazilian Portuguese and continental Portuguese, or we could think of older examples like um, uh, Spanish and Italian, that sort of thing. Okay, so this shift in average characteristics over time is in either a language or a species means that separate populations could eventually become mutually unintelligible to one another, form new languages, or genetically incompatible with one another, and form new species. But the process is a gradient over time. And it's decidedly tricky to draw a line on a gradient. So we could go back to that slide with um, Anglo-Saxon at the top, and we could say, OK, who was the first speaker of modern English? Well, that's decidedly tricky, isn't it? Because it's a gradient process over time. OK, so evolution there, so that's sort of an idea to kind of get us into the way of thinking about how populations might shift their average characteristics if they separate over time. That was Darwin's hypothesis. I told you that there's all this evidence for it, so come on, Dr. Reynolds, let's see some of that evidence. And one of the things that I really like and really enjoy about evolution is that it sometimes forces you into rather counterintuitive <laughs> predictions, and this is one of my favorites. I don't have time to lay out all the lines of evidence for you that suggest that whales, modern day whales, and I'll use the word cetaceans, because that's the name of that group, so whales, dolphins, porpoises, and so on. So if I say cetaceans, I just mean whales. Evolution based on evidence from comparative morphology and the fact that whales are mammals and such predicts that modern day whales are actually descended from four limbed terrestrial tetrapods, four limbed terrestrial four limbed mammals. So there's a hypothesis that we can frame. We can say, okay, the hypothesis is that modern whales are descended from four limbed terrestrial organisms. The prediction that this makes, or one of many predictions that this makes, is that the fossil record should have some species in it that blur the distinction between a present-day whale and four-limbed terrestrial organisms. Now, the probability of finding actual ancestors is vanishingly small, but the probability that we should at least find some relatives of this proposed lineage is actually quite good. So what we're looking for is we're looking for relatives, not necessarily a direct lineage. Interestingly, when Darwin published in 1859, he mentions this hypothesis because it's fairly certain that from the fact that whales are mammals, and he speculates that perhaps it was a bear-like ancestor, and he got absolutely lambasted for it. There's a Christian apologist who takes him to task and mocks him mercilessly. So that section was actually greatly reduced in the second edition of Origin, and the reason why is because Darwin was embarrassed by that because it was such an outlandish claim. And one of the main things that this Christian apologist takes them to task for is the fact that there are no species that would even remotely suggest such a transition in the fossil record that we known at that time. Interestingly enough, whales are something of a poster child for evolution now, because we've I've uncovered so many forms in the fossil record that are suggestive of this transition. So again, these are not direct ancestors that you're looking at. So there is a direct ancestral lineage, presumably, and what we're looking at are species that we see that are thought to be relatives of this lineage. Now, these critters down here probably don't look like much like whales to you. What's interesting about them is they have a certain feature of their skulls that was thought to be characteristic of only whales until their discovery in the fossil record. So we see things in the fossil record that don't look anything like present-day species, four-limbed. This species, interestingly enough, was actually known at the time of Darwin, but the species was not well, the samples that they had was not, they were not well preserved enough to retain the very, very tiny hind limbs that these species have. Of course, in present day whales, there are no hind limbs at all, they're just four limbs. 
So if species, if samples had been known of the species that preserved those over time, it might have been a different conversation with that particular Christian apologist. So we fail to reject the hypothesis that whales are descended from terrestrial mammals simply based on what we see in the fossil record. Here's another interesting line of evidence that we can look at. We can look at present day whales and look at aspects of their embryological development. And we can compare them to other mammalian embryos. So I've just told you that modern day whales don't have four limbs. They only have front limbs, front flippers. But interestingly enough, that's actually not true. Whales do have four limbs, but they only have four limbs for a very short period of their embryological development. So at the same time when other mammals as embryos are making four limb buds and also hind limb buds, these are dolphin embryos. Dolphins, whales, and porpoises also make hind limb buds at the same time that any good mammal should make hind limb buds. We've actually done some of the molecular biology on this now, and what's happening here is there's a standard developmental program that's running to say make a, a limb bud. And then later on in development, there's actually another program that runs only in the hind limb that basically says, no, 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 don't do that. Okay, stop that. No, bad, stop. Okay, pull that back in. Yeah, we don't need that. But it's cobbled on top of this previous program that says make a hind limb bud, just like any other mammal should make. I don't have the slides in here. But one of the things I also sometimes talk about is that whales also start off with two nostrils on the front of the face, just like any good mammal should have. And then only later during development do you see migration to the top of the head. And in toothed whales, it actually fuses into a single blowhole. In the baleen whales, you still have two nostrils, as it were, but they're in a casing, sort of a single casing on the top of the head. But they start off with two nostrils on the front of their face, just like any good mammal should have. Of course, in this time of DNA sequencing, we now have the ability to do DNA analysis of all sorts of present-day species, and whales are no exception. We've done this analysis as well. So what one can do with this is one can look for remnants of genes or remnants of DNA that are indicative of once having been adapted to a terrestrial way of life. And whales have these, which is kind of interesting. So one thing that whales have, like all mammals have, is they have a number of genes that are devoted to the sense of smell. These things that are called olfactory receptor genes. So here we go. I know it's a technical title. Tooth whales, this is what we're talking about. So things like dolphins and killer whales and whatnot. Mammals have about a thousand genes devoted to a sense, our sense of smell. These are genes that are made into proteins, and those proteins sit on our nasal epithelium, so on the surfaces of our nose. When we breathe in air, stuff sticks onto those proteins, changes their shape, and that change in shape is what we perceive as a change in nervous system activity. Mammals have about a thousand of these on average. Some mammalian lineages, however, have lost quite a large number of these. If you've ever taken a dog for a walk, you know that the dog is experiencing the world visually, yes, but also through the sense of smell as you're getting dragged here and there, right? Dogs have retained a large um, a large amount of those thousand genes. Primates like us, we've actually lost quite a few, and whales have lost large numbers of them as well. And uh, the toothed whales especially. And the reason for that is whales don't use the sense of, a sense of smell for hunting. In fact, you have to hold your breath when you're hunting underwater. So an olfactory breathing in air to smell system just doesn't really fit with your lifestyle anymore. But the interesting thing is the remains of those genes are still in their genome. They've just been picking up mutations for a really long period of time, so that they're not active, but we can see their correspondence with genes that we see in other animals. And same thing for the various pigments that we use for visual pigments. So whales have visual pigments that you would use to see in high light environments, even though they hunt in low light or even in darkness, because they use amplification rather than visual acuity. What's interesting about the toothed whales is they, as far as we can tell, they don't even have an olfactory organ in The blowhole is just sort of a straight shot from the body wall to the lungs, and there's no olfactory system associated with it anymore. So what we see here is an example of what biologists and scientists in general just love. When you have converging lines of evidence from different disciplines that converge on a common explanation. So we have that original hypothesis that whales descend from terrestrial four limb vertebrates. And we see with our DNA sequencing, the fossil record, and embryology, 
as well as the lines of evidence that sort of started us along this path in the first place compared to the notion of physiology, we see that they're all suggesting the same transition. So as such, we fail to reject this hypothesis, even though we've looked at it in some detail. Okay. As far as we know, whales don't lose any sleep over the theological challenges that arise. Oh, maybe they do. Maybe they don't, they don't come from those dirty land dwelling, you know, things or you know, uh, data special data for the ocean. I'm not sure. But as Christians, it's something that we are very concerned about. We're curious. What about the lines of evidence for human evolution? These lines of evidence that we've seen, do they also apply to our own species? And the short answer is yes. All those lines of evidence that I've just shown you for whales also apply to humans as well. So one of the things, and I won't focus on all those different lines of evidence, but one of them that is quite compelling because of its recent sort of predominance in biology is to look at DNA sequencing to compare our genome to the genomes of other organisms on the planet. So before genome sequencing was done, it was something of an open question as to which species on the planet we were most closely related to. It was either thought to be chimpanzees or gorillas. DNA sequencing has resolved this for us. We are most closely related to chimpanzees. We share a common ancestral population with them about four to six million years ago. And with gorillas, uh, the population of gorillas is a little bit back. It's at about six to eight million years ago, or, or six to ten. What's interesting about genome sequencing compared to language change over time is that language changes overnight by comparison. Species actually change their DNA sequences at a glacial pace in comparison. So it might be interesting for you to know that when you look at the human genome and the chimpanzee genome and lay them out next to each other, they are 95% identical to one another as we line them up base pair for base pair. So not only do we have the same genes, and actually genes are only a very, very tiny percentage of that 95% or of our genomes in general. We only have a very small percentage of our genomes that are genes. But not only do we have the same genes, we also have them in the same order. Another way to put this is our two genomes are exactly what one would predict as slightly modified versions of an ancestral genome. And to put this in context, our genomes are more similar to one another than Italian is to Spanish. As an example. This is an old figure from the 1980s, so back in the dark ages for most of us, most of the students here. This is when we were doing DNA staining just to look at whole chromosomes to get an idea of what their structure looked like. And on the left, you have a human chromosome, and on the right, you have paired with it a chimpanzee chromosome. And what you can see, just sort of visually, is that in many cases there's striking correspondence. We've now, of course, sequenced over this, and we know that this, the pattern that you're seeing is actually indicative of high, very high, sequence conservation of this species. Now, there are some differences. Here's one that you might know about. You can also see cases where there's been breakage and rejoining. So, there's, so you can see on this chromosome, everything matches up until you get to about here, and then this is kind of flipped with this, and then everything matches here. We know about how chromosomes can have breakage and flips and rejoining events. So we see some of those things. But what we see is a huge amount, an overwhelming amount of genetic similarity or identity between these two species. I mentioned olfactory receptor pseudogenes in whales previously, and I mentioned that primates have also lost a large number of these as well. And that's actually not such a bad thing because we live in pretty crowded conditions as a social animal, and if we had the olfactory acuity of a dog, we would be able to say, hmm, somebody didn't have a shower this morning, or but we don't. And the reason for that is that we too have lost quite a large number of these olfactory receptor genes. What's interesting though is that most of that loss wasn't something that happened just to our species, but actually happened in common ancestral populations leading up to our species. So that produces a very interesting effect. And it actually allowed us to resolve this question of who's our closest relative, is it the chimp or the gorilla? So let me explain how this works. But first off, let's talk about this just briefly. Sometimes non-biologists ask me, well, how do you know you're looking at a defective gene? It, this is an analogy, but it's the same way I know that I'm looking at a defective building. So if you walk across the field and came across this, unless it was a specially constructed movie set, which would be kind of strange, but I suppose it's formally possible, 
we would know that, okay, this has a structure, but we can also tell that certain parts of the structure are missing. So it doesn't have the original structure as it was originally constructed. Same thing with genes in the genome. You can see that there's a good amount of that gene that's still there, but parts of it are missing, and those missing bits are necessary for its function. The interesting thing is that the enzymes that do DNA copying don't know what they're copying. They just try to make as faithful a copy as they possibly can. So what that means is even after a gene is mutated and lost its function, it can stick around in a genome for a very long period of time because its enzymes just try to make as faithful a copy as they possibly can. They also can't fix previous errors because they don't know what they're copying. Okay. So not only do we have these defective remnants of genes in our genomes, we also notice these in other species. And as I sometimes say to my students, if we had never thought of the idea of evolution before we started doing DNA sequencing and comparing different organisms, that process of looking at the DNA of different organisms on the planet would have forced us to that hypothesis because the evidence is so compelling. Here's sort of, sort of the thing that we see. So these are just names of genes, just boring names. They're named after their locations in the genome. And you're looking at the status of these different genes in four different species, humans, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans. So we often notice, and these are all these olfactory receptor genes, so primates have lost a huge number of these. So we see things that are disrupted. So wherever you see text, that's just indicating where there's a mutation. But the thing that we notice that's very striking is that we often see exactly the same mutation right down to the same DNA letter in different species. So here's these are two that are shared between three species. This one down here is shared with all four. Here's an example that's just shared with two, and so on. So as a biologist, we're then faced with a sort of competing explanations. Why do we see identical mutations in the same genes in two species? Well, one hypothesis is that these mutations have happened independently in those two species. Another hypothesis is that they, these, that mutation happened once, in the common ancestral population of that species, and then that mutation was inherited as those species went their separate ways. So let's just have a look and sort of see what we see when we look at this evidence. <coughs> we see some mutations that are absolutely unique to a given species. So here's 15 that are just in humans, foreign, chimpanzees, and so on. Here are three that are identical between humans and chimpanzees. Here are an additional three that are identical between these species. There's six that are shared by all four. And when there's a number there, that's indicating absolutely identical mutations in the same genes. So the other thing to notice is what we don't see. We don't see a case where we say, oh, we see a certain mutation in humans, we see it in gorillas, but we don't see it in chimpanzees. We don't see that. If we see it in humans and we see it in gorillas, we can predict with great confidence that we will see it in chimpanzees. Likewise, if we see it in humans and in orangutans, we also expect to see it in gorillas and chimpanzees, and we do. Now, the reason for that, of course, is the common ancestral population, say, of humans and orangutans, this population also has other species that branch off from it. So if a mutation happens back here, such that we see it in humans and we see it in orangutans, we would also expect that mutation to show up in gorilla and also expect to see it show up in chimpanzee, and we do. So that's a neat example. And it was this sort of evidence that allowed us to decide that humans are more closely related to chimpanzees than they are to gorillas. Another example that I like to use is the Vivilagen one. We'll get to that in a minute. I've got some slides out of order here, unfortunately. Sorry about that. Sometimes the question arises, what about, could it not be that these are in fact functional genes? So sometimes the, the, when I'm discussing this with Christians, Sometimes they'll say, well, how do you know for sure that what you're looking at is actually not a functional gene? Could it possibly be that God just needed a function in that organism and it happens to look like that? But there's actually some function there and you're just sort of assuming that there's no function. I'm going to try to give you sort of an understanding of why biologists are quite convinced by showing you a sequence uh, now comparison between humans and another species, actually comparison with mice. So here's a particular gene in humans. This is just a representation of the human chromosome. And wherever you see these little black bars, that's just where genes are. So this is sort of like a genome browser that a biologist would look at. Look at. This gene is also present in the mouse genome. So now we're looking at a section of the mouse chromosome. That gene is a functional gene in mice. 
But you can see this little side here. This is a pseudogene in humans, so it's picked up a number of mutations which don't allow it to function. And we can see by sequence comparisons that it's very, very similar, almost identical to this gene in mouse, but it's got mutations that remove its function. Now, this is what I'd like you to notice. This gene sits in a contact with other next door neighbor genes in the genome. So their function isn't important, they have different functions. This is present in humans, it's also present in mice. This one's present in humans, it's also present in mice, and so on. This is actually one of those cases where we've had one of those flips. But the point is, is that we see this sequence settled in a context that is the same in humans and in mice. So if one wants to make the argument that this actually is a functional gene that was independently created by God, these are two species perhaps now under that hypothesis that are independently created, we would be forced to make the following sort of claims. We would say, okay, God needed to make a function here at this particular point in the genome. Now is God powerful enough to make that function in any part of the genome that he wants? Of course it is. And it has to have a sequence that's very similar to what we see as a functional gene in mice. Now, could God use a different sequence to accomplish that function? Well, of course he could. God's all powerful. He can make genes and sequences and functions however he likes. So we end up having to make an argument that says, we needed to have this particular sequence, we needed to have it right here, and it needed to have a very, very similar sequence to what we see as this, this gene in mice, but these two things cannot be doing the same thing. Which is, most Christian biologists, when faced with these lines of evidence, as well as the other lines of evidence that I've shown to you, take a different approach. They say, it looks like humans and mice share a common ancestor if you go far enough back in the past. And in one lineage, this gene function was lost. Okay, this is just because biologists get bored and they don't like genome databases on their breaks. This is a section of that gene just in DNA letter code. And here's the functional one in mice. Here's a functional one in dogs. Dogs have a functional version of this gene as well. Chimpanzees actually have the same pseudogene that humans do, as you might expect. And here's one mutation that they share. So that one DNA <coughs> that's missing renders the rest of this gene not um, able to function properly. And humans and chimpanzees have that exact same change. So presumably that mutation happened before humans and chimps, the lineage leading to humans and chimps separate. Okay. Here's another example that I like to use. Do you remember how I told you that enzymes that do the DNA copying, they, do, they try to make as faithful a copy as they possibly can? Well, what this means is that you can actually have the remnants of a gene sit in a lineage for an extremely long period of time before it's sort of obscured. And here's one example. These vitilogenin genes, I talked about this in the book as well. I don't have time to give you the lines of evidence, but humans like, and all placental mammals are proposed to share common ancestors with egg-laying organisms. So it seems like placental mammal, the placental mammal way of life is an innovation if you go far enough back inside a group of egg-laying organisms. Egg-laying organisms use these genes called vitilogenins. So vitilogenins are what are a major component of egg yolk. So whenever you crack an egg to make scrambled eggs or whatever, most of what you're seeing in the yolk is this thing called vitilogenin. Now egg-laying organisms need a way to provide nutrients for their embryos before the eggshell is deposited. Because once the eggshell is deposited, there's no way for the mother to supply nutrition to the embryo. Now, placental mammals don't have that problem because we maintain a placental connection through the umbilical cord with our embryos all the way up until the point of birth. So this has got to be some graduate students sitting in the round in the lab one day saying, you know, I wonder if we can find the remains of egg-laying genes in placental mammal genomes. Oh, I don't know, the database is right there. Okay, let's go look. So this is what they did. And they used that same trick that we were just looking at with the mouse genome. So the chicken genome had been sequenced and published at that point. So they simply said, okay, let's look in the chicken genome for vitilogenin gene sequences. So here's one, and two, and three. There's three of them. Then they just noted what genes are nearby in the chicken genome. And they also noted, just asked the question, where are those genes in the human genome? And as they expected, there's correspondence between those genes as well. So of course the obvious prediction is, well, let's look very carefully at these regions of the human genome to see if there's evidence for any remnants of this sequence. And when you do that, you find those remnants, which is really cool. So wherever you see a black bar here in this schematic diagram, that's where there's sequence correspondence between the human chromosome and the chicken chromosome. 
and you can see that there are fragments of sequence that correspond to the different fiddly genome sequences. Interestingly enough, we also see this in opossums as well. Actually, we see it in marsupials in general. So marsupials are not placental mammals, and there's another type of mammal on the planet as well uh, that you might be familiar with, the platypus and the echidna, which is the other part of that, the other member of that group, that are egg-laying mammals. Egg-laying mammals retain the functional versions of the bibliogenids. Opossums, as marsupials, have lost it, so theirs are fragmentary as well, but they're in the same spatial pattern. So, not to put too fine a point on it, but if you use evolution to predict, you should find the remnants of egg-laying genes in placental mammal genomes. You can successfully find those fragmentary remains. And again, this is just biologists getting bored. And looking at a large number of placental mammals, this is a sequence of one of those little fragments that's conserved between them. And we notice a large number of mutations that are shared. So this was lost really early on in placental mammal development. Okay. So all of that leads us to this sort of statement, the truth about evolution. We say, okay, I hope this doesn't turn into a brand, but I want to even more. This is not me, this is a, a colleague of mine. He says, evolution is not a theory of crisis. It's not teetering on the verge of collapse. It is not failed as a scientific explanation. There is evidence for evolution, gods and gods of it. It's not speculation, it's not a face choice, it's not an assumption. It's a productive framework. It has amazing explanatory power. There's no conspiracy to hide a failure of it. There's really been no failure as, as of evolution as a scientific theory. It works, and it works well. And then Todd goes on to say, I say these things not because I'm crazy or because I've converted to evolution. It might surprise you to know that this is actually a younger creationist who's writing this. Todd Wood is a biologist. He's a trained as a geneticist. And he actually does not think evolution is true because he holds to a younger creationist interpretation of Genesis, and he thinks that that needs to take priority. But he's also very frustrated with the younger creationist community because he thinks that they're wasting their time with all these spurious anti-evolution arguments, when in fact, Todd's convinced that there must be a deeper way to synthesize younger creationism with the evidence that we see. Now, I wish him well on that, but I don't think it will ultimately be successful. But Todd is nonetheless not willing to deny the evidence that is there because he thinks that that's a hindrance to actually young earth creationism actually achieving its goal, which is kind of interesting. He doesn't make it, it this approach doesn't win him any friends in the, in the young earth movement. Uh, he says, I'm not crazy, I'm not, I don't say these things because I'm crazy or because I've converted to evolution, I say these things because they are true. Todd's a very interesting character. If you're interested in a younger, or if you perhaps feel like you align yourself more with a younger creationist type of approach, go read Todd Wood. He's an absolutely fascinating read, and he has a lot of respect for the stance that he takes. Okay, so that's evolution. Normally, when I give a presentation like this, it's very common for people to say, okay, well, what about the intelligent design movement? I've heard a lot about intelligent design arguments. You're saying some things that seem pretty compelling an evolutionary point of view, but aren't there things that evolution doesn't explain? What about intelligent design? And I actually spent a whole chapter in the book discussing intelligent design arguments, because it's a very common response after Christians are exposed to the evidence for evolution to start asking questions about intelligent design. You might be familiar with Stephen Meyer, who's a proponent of intelligent design, a philosopher and historian of science. One of the claims that Meyer makes, in a nutshell, is that evolution is not capable of generating new information. He says, um, since the case for intelligent design as the best explanation for the origin of biological information necessary to build novel forms of life depends in part on the claim that functional, information-rich genes and proteins cannot be explained by random mutation and selection. This type of design hypothesis implies that selection and mutation will not suffice to produce gen genetic information. Another thing that sometimes folks ask after seeing my slides is they say, well, Dennis, you've said a lot about losing genes. Right? We've seen the loss of a number of different types of genes, but you haven't said anything about how new genes might come to be. Is it possible that new information could come into a system through evolution? And Stephen Meyer would say no. But in fact, we do see evidence excuse me, of new information coming into the system. So we can ask this question. Are information rich genes and proteins possible for evolution to produce through mutation and natural selection? Or, as Meyer would say, is biological information indicative of intelligent design? Now, maybe one thing I'll just say as an aside. As Christians, we believe that God is intelligent. As Christians, we believe that God is the designer. 
But that's not the same thing as intelligent design, capital I, capital D. Right? Intelligent design, in that sense, is a particular movement that maintains various anti-evolutionary stances as part of their cluster of arguments. But as Christians, we maintain that yes, God is intelligent, and God is the designer of all that we see. Absolutely. Okay, so let's, let's not uh, confuse those things. Okay, so here's a question. Does new information show up in evolution? And the answer from comparative genomics is overwhelmingly yes, which is really kind of cool. One of the very interesting things that we've learned as we've sequenced genomes of different species <coughs> is that sometimes genome it, lineages actually have what's called whole chromosome or whole genome duplication events. So if you've studied cell biology, and some of you might be biology students here, you've learned about the processes of cell uh, chromosome division during cell division. Sometimes that process fails, such that you end up with two copies of every chromosome instead of the division that's supposed to take place. Now, in a species like us, that's not going to survive. But interestingly enough, even in the present day, there are species on the planet, fish and amphibians in particular, that can have this happen to them, and it's actually not detrimental to them. And it looks like, based on genomic sequencing, that this sort of thing happened not only once, but twice in the lineage that led to vertebrates, as one particular. So let me try to walk you through this. Um, it's a bit technical. If this gets too techno babble, just you know, think about something else for five minutes, and then I'll call you back in a second. Some of us are going to be biologists and geek out for a minute. So vertebrates. So we were just talking about humans. So we're up here. Tetrapods, whales are up here too. Are closely related to fish because we're vertebrates. Tetrapods are actually an innovation among fish. So if you go back far enough, every vertebrate lineage, if you go back far enough, is something that you would call similar to a fish. There are other organisms on the planet that are chordates, but are not vertebrates. So they have a notochord, but they're not vertebrates. Tunicates are an example of this. So these are these funny little sea squirt things. If you've ever seen one of these, I might say at an aquatic center. So what's interesting is these are our closest relatives that are not vertebrates. And it's thought, it has been thought for a very long period of time that perhaps there were whole genome duplication events on this branch of the lineage leading to present-day vertebrates that invertebrates, even closely related invertebrates, just simply didn't get. So what happens when you have a whole genome duplication event is you end up with large numbers of copies of genes and these copies are called uh, paralogs. So if you have duplicates of genes that arise from duplication within a genome, they're called paralogs of each other. So if you have a duplication event, so here's a hypothetical chromosome, here's after it's duplicated. You end up with a copy of everything. Now, if that's not fatal to the lineage, and in some cases it's actually beneficial, we've seen in present-day organisms, if you keep those for a long period of time, over time, some of those genes might be lost. Because obviously you didn't need two copies of everything when the duplication first happened. It was sort of an optional thing at that time. But then over time, you might come to depend on some of those duplicates. This isn't a lineage over millions of years. We end up with this pattern, where we may have lost some, but there's still this overall pattern. Here's what, it would have, what, it would, what things would look like if after another few million years, this lineage also went through duplication. So that this is just a double of this. And then again, over time, some things would be lost. So you would end up with a situation where you could have up to four, or three, or two, or maybe just one copy of these different genes that are left over. But the point is that they would still have this interesting facial pattern. So the question that biologists had was, OK, is there any evidence for this at the genomic level? We have some evidence to suggest that maybe this took place, but the real sort of evidence would be as if we saw this four copies of things in the same spatial orientation in genomes. So the question that you have to ask is, well, what genes were around at the time when that species went through those doublings, that lineage went through those doublings? And the genes that would have been around would have been the same genes that would have been present in this last common ancestral population that before it speciated towards this lineage and towards this lineage. So what these biologists did is they simply said, OK, any genes that tunicates share with vertebrates most likely would have been present at this point. 
So let's look at those genes only and look to see what spatial pattern they have in the genome. And when you do that, this is what you see. So this is human chromosome 2. This is just an example, a subset of their data. Human chromosome 10, 12, and 17. So what you're looking at with each line, each line is pointing to where a particular gene is, and then also pointing to where its closest copy is in the genome. And what we see is, over and over again, we see, so for example here with these green lines, here are all these copies on chromosome 10 that happen to line up in a spatial pattern with part of chromosome 2. Now if you look at genes that are not present in all three groups, now we're going to look at genes that are only present in fish and only present in tetrapods. They have this pattern in the genome. So we do find duplicates, so new stuff is being made, but you'll notice that the duplicates all tend to be really close to one another. So there's not, it's not like we're seeing this whole section of a chromosome which really looks like it's got the same genes on it from these two sections here. So all this to say is that when we look at a genome-wide level in vertebrates, we do see evidence that these two whole rounds of genome duplication took place because of the spatial orientation of the genes that we're looking at. And here's the catch. These genes in present-day vertebrates have different functions. Even though they have similar sequences, the copies have picked up different functions over time. So here's a case where we have duplications of genes and then mutations to those duplicates over time being selected for different functions. So this is an overwhelming amount of evidence to suggest that yes, new genes do show up as copies of old genes in many cases, and those new copies can go on to produce and pick up new functions. Sometimes we actually even see this in a more dramatic situation. So here's one of my other favorite examples. I talk about this in the book as well. In the 1970s, there was actually some studies done in Japan in tailing ponds of chemical factories. And what some biologists noticed was that there was a bacterial population in that tailing pond that was living off of nylon. Now, nylon is a man, a human-made chemical. It's an artificial chemical. It was invented in the 1920s. And here we have a bacteria that's actually using it as a carbon source. So it's digesting it and only using that. It can use it to the exclusion of anything else. So the scientists were very curious to find out where this gene had come from, or where this function had come from. It turns out that actually a single mutation in another gene simultaneously destroyed the previous gene's function, so it's not capable of being used at all. This single DNA letter insertion now produces a gene that has completely different amino acids compared to the first gene. Those of you that are biologists know that if you put a single letter into a, into a code, that the code is read off in groups of three. So if you put one letter, new letter in there, it's now the reading code frame shifts over by one. So you get completely new amino acids. And it just so happens that these really, this new gene that sort of arose in an instant is a really, really lousy nylonase. Nylonase meaning it's an enzyme that can degrade nylon. Now it's really bad at it, but subsequent mutations occurred later such that it actually refined its ability to be actually a pretty good nylonase. So you start with this really rudimentary function, and that rudimentary function is enough to be slightly better than the competitors, because if you can if you can eat nylon, because there's tons of nylon around in those tailing ponds, it gives you a slight advantage over your neighbors that can't do that. And evolution at this point has picked up a new function that no one had ever seen on the planet before because nylon had been. Okay, I think maybe it's in the interest of time, I'll skip over this example. I talked about it in the book, if you'd like. We see new genes in humans that crop up as well. And they come through the similar sequences that we see in other species. Design arguments have a very long history within Christianity. Anybody who studied the history of Christianity and apologetics knows that design arguments have been around for a very long time. Here's actually one of my favorite books from the 1690s, written by somebody named John Edwards. Now, Here's the title of his book, right? And that's not the whole title. There's other parts of the title down here. My editor at Baker would not let me have a title that in present day, right? But in a lot of ways, this is sort of Christian apologetics circa 1690s or so. And just as a note, this is John Edwards. This is not Jonathan Edwards, the American theologian, in case you're thinking that it might be Jonathan Edwards. It's not John Edwards. He was actually concerned about the sun at that time Solar fusion is, nobody understands solar fusion. So there was thoughts around the sun, and the question was, well, how can the sun just keep burning, right? 
where did, where's the source of that fuel for the sun to burn for such an incredibly long amount of time? And he says, you know, if it be asked, whence is the fuel for those vast fires? They continually burn. Whence is it that they are not spent and exhausted? How are those flames fed? And he says, nobody can resolve these questions but the Almighty Creator, who just bestowed on them their being, who made them great and wonderful, and that in them we might read his existence, his power, and his providence. So he's saying nobody's going to be able to figure this out. Nobody can explain this. So it's evidence that God is the author of this particular process. Now, of course, in the present time, we know about solar fusion, but Edwards is actually making a design inference at this point. There's no known causal explanation for the longevity of solar combustion. God can maintain solar combustion in a miracle by providing fuel. There's no natural explanation. Therefore, we can infer from solar combustion that God exists. And this is an inference for the best, to the best explanation that he would say. But of course, this only works up until the point where that scientific explanation comes into being. Now, now that we understand solar fusion, as Christians, we're very comfortable saying that this is how God intended the process to work. We don't somehow think it's an affront or a threat to God to have a scientific explanation for how solar fusion works in the sun. Okay. Edwards is very clear on his purpose for writing. He says, if I, cannot, if I cannot by this attempt convince atheists, yet I hope to do something towards preventing the spreading of that pernicious infection of which they are the authors of. So he's saying, look, the point of sort of putting these arguments out there is to sort of stamp down atheism. Or he says, if my hopes fail me to this, yet I will not spare confirming and strengthening such as who are really persuaded of the doctrine you're treated of. In other words, even if I don't step on the atheists, adequately, at least I'll provide intellectual support for Christians who believe in the of God. Okay. So our design arguments that rely on lack of evidence are a good idea for Christians to employ? That's a very leading question, and of course you probably know that I think. No, probably not a good idea. This is a quote from the Dietrich Bonhoeffer that I absolutely love. He says, Weizacker's book, The Worldview of Physics, is still keeping me very busy. It has again brought home to me quite clearly how wrong it is to use God as a stopgap for the incompleteness of our knowledge. If, in fact, the frontiers of knowledge are being pushed back, and that is bound to be the case, then God is being pushed back with them and is therefore continually in retreat. And here's the part I love so much. We are to find God in what we know. Wow, that's actually hearkening back to Enlightenment Europe when Christianity was thought to be absolutely compatible with the scientific enterprise. God wants us to realize his presence not in unsolved problems, but in those that are solved. Okay. So one way to put this is that we're very used to thinking about evolution as in opposition to design. I grew up as an evangelical, I'm still an evangelical, and I knew, like, as I grew up as a young person, I, if I heard the word Darwin, or if I heard the word evolution, that was a bad word. You didn't talk about that, right? That's bad. That's like hearing somebody swear. Right? And I learned, just sort of by osmosis, that evolution is against God in some way. I have a different view now. I have a view that actually evolution could be a form of design. Just like solar combustion with solar fusion is actually an elegant design for keeping the star fuel for a long period of time. And with that, I'll open it up for questions and discussions. Thank you very much for your attention and patience. Chicago. 
his whole half of the book is to say, okay, if evolution is the case, if there's good scientific evidence for evolution, and actually one of the things that we talk about in the book is that there's also very good evidence that humans never descended uniquely from a single couple. One of the things that you learn tonight is that evolution is a population level phenomenon. It's about populations that shift their average characteristics over time. So the genetic evidence that we have also suggests quite strongly that humans have never been below about 10,000 individuals at any point in our evolutionary history. So the interesting question at that point is to say, well, what does one do theologically at that point? What we really need to do is, if we think back to that earlier slide where we've got, you know, we've got God as the author of science, of the natural, the natural revelation, and the scriptural revelation, it may well be that after a long period of time where the science is quite strong and quite settled, not, not that it's completely settled, but that we've been at this for a really long time and it really seems to suggest that evolution is in fact correct and that population genetics is actually quite correct. I haven't shown you that evidence today. Then one, as a Christian, needs to sit down and have a hard think about is it possible that we've actually been expecting things of the Genesis narratives that were not intended by the original authors of the original author of Genesis? So it's very possible, because we've done this as Christians in the past, that we've come to Genesis 1 and 2 with modern expectations and modern, we're, we're expecting it to answer the modern questions that we have. And one of the challenges is to, as um, John Walton likes to say, is to say we need to take our place in the audience. We need to try to hear it on the original audience's terms and in the original audience's way. So what Scott does in his half of the book is basically address that question. And his conclusions, I mean, they're hard to kind of summarize because, you know, biblical scholars have you know, 40,000 words to get the point of, get the point of Christ. It's okay, I take 40,000 words to talk about science in the first half of the book, so very fair. Scott's conclusion is that we've actually built things from our modern expectation. We've, we had an expectation of Genesis 1 and 2, and actually in Romans 5 as well, that we're bringing to the text because we have modern science, so we expect the scriptures to be talking about modern science. And Scott's not convinced that that is actually what the original authors had in mind. So at that point, there's a number of different ways that one can sort of think about how the science and scripture could be reconciled, as it were. But yeah, the short answer is, is that everybody descending genetically from two individuals does not look like it's scientifically kind of long. Yeah, but, and then that puts us into that interesting state, like I say to my students, and what do you ask we get to be in a part in a time in history when the church gets to wrestle with these questions? Maybe one thing I'll just say, sort of to finish up on that, is to say, I'm not so concerned that everybody in the church immediately come to this understanding of the science. I mean, it took the geocentrism thing a long time to work its way through the church as well, although science moves a lot more quickly now than it is back, did back then. My concerns are primarily missional, in that, you know, there are good barriers to faith, right? When we present the gospel to people, we talk to them about the cost of discipleship, we talk to them about the sacrifice that one makes to follow Jesus, right? And those are good barriers, right? We shouldn't just say to people, ah, you know, don't worry, you don't have to change your lifestyle at all. Come follow Jesus. Well, no, things are going to change. Come to Jesus, and then the Spirit will work through you, and you will be changed. So there are good barriers to faith. I'm very frightened that we might be putting up some bad barriers to faith. And one of those bad barriers to faith might be, ah, you have to reject evolution in order to come to Jesus. I'm, I'm frightened that we might be doing that. Great question. Other questions? I still have a microphone. <laughs> Now, I was working in a field that wasn't direct 
currently, you know, I, obviously if I can avoid this evidence throughout my PhD, I was working on an area of cell biology and development in fruit flies. So I would have benefited from understanding evolution, but it wasn't something I needed for my absolute needed for my particular field. One of my claims to fame as an undergrad is I actually stood up and like sort of like called out an evolutionary biologist in her department and then uh, talked about like listed off all these sort of canards that you know common sort of arguments against. And he was very gracious. He could have just like wiped the floor with me. But he didn't. He was very gracious. And um, I actually got into contact with him after I changed my views, had a bunch of Trinity Western to, to give a talk, and was able to show to him um, that I had changed my views and also that I was uh, you know, willing to admit my mistake. And that part of what was going on there was that I felt that I had been a poor witness to him prior, but now I could, I could hopefully you know, be a better witness to him. So that was kind of interesting. But yeah, I didn't, I didn't experience much in any of, well, there was one or two biologists in the department that were kind of atheists and kind of give their takes against Christianity in general, but I just kind of broke them off. So yeah, it was actually pretty remarkably uh, problem free. Great question. Great. Um, there we go. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> People can't hear if you don't have a mic. that suffering 
gives them isn't an aberration or it's not the way things aren't supposed to be, but yeah. that is actually built in as a fundamental part of how things are. Um, just wondering what, what your thought is in relation to that. Yeah, an author I've really found helpful on that point is somebody I, I mentioned previously, uh, John Walton, who is um, an Old Testament scholar for a week. And he's written a number of books discussing the context and setting of the Genesis narratives. And I won't do his thesis justice here, but if you're interested, he's written um, a couple of books. They all have The Lost World as part of the title. Lost World of Genesis 1 and then Lost World of Adam and Eve are two books that I would recommend. One of the things that he talks about in that book and those books is that we've taken that idea like where God says it's good. We've taken that to mean a certain thing. Right? But there's actually a Hebrew word for perfect, closer to what we would call absolute perfection. And God also says that <clears throat> humans are very good. So good can't be absolutely perfect because there's a, a notch about that. Humans are very good. There's also um, thoughts or an idea in Genesis that there is, there is chaos out there. right? And what we see with God creating is he's actually forming that chaos and subduing it to a certain degree, such that there's a, a place and a setting that humans can thrive. But then he calls us as co-regents with him, creatures that bear his image. And John's thesis is that we're intended to take that sort of first fruits of ordered creation and expand its borders into the chaos that surrounds it. So the command to subdue and to, to fill the earth would be seen as sort of expanding the boundaries of God's ordered space to the unordered parts. Um, the other creation narratives in the Bible that we don't pay a lot of attention to really go into this thing as well. So there's one in, I think it's in Job, or I'm really showing the ignorance here, but there's, there's a creation narrative where it talks about um, God um, subduing Le Leviathan, right? Sort of like the chaos in God forming order out of chaos. So it might be that our ideas, and again, there's a, we have a lot of Plato in us, as opposed to you know, a Jewish worldview. And that Platonic worldview is to think, you know, absolute perfection, there was no suffering, there was no death. A Jewish worldview actually is, would possibly be in a more natural fit of what we're doing with the science. And that might, again, just be that we've been reading the Bible a certain way. But this science doesn't predispose what we're going to do when we're sort of faced with this challenge where we see, okay, science seems to be saying one thing, our scriptural interpretation previously seemed to be saying this one thing. Science can never determine what biblical scholars will decide, but it, as, as Scott sort of says, it can cause you to rethink and to say, ah, as Christians, we're fundamentally committed that these two forms of revelation have to cohere with one another. And here's one place where it really seems like there's a discontinuity between the two. Is it possible that perhaps we misjudge something? So it can bring you to the text again to allow it to speak for itself. Not that science is dictating what, it's going, what those conclusions will be, but it can be sort of a flag to us that perhaps we need to go back and do some work. So I would recommend John, on, John Walton on that. But thank you. Fantastic question. I think we have time maybe for one more. One more question, and then we're going to... Anybody have one more? Okay. Uh, this is a question more specifically aimed at your book. Uh, as a biology major, I've experienced a lot of discussion over these issues um, and have like, been challenged a lot of these thoughts. But back home, my parents and, and friends aren't experiencing those things. Uh, so this is a book that's accessible. That, accessible to those people that I could buy and, and let them read to just um, like have a, a more full understanding of like the, the, what I'm learning in classes. Yeah. Okay, I want to know how much you pay just to say that. When I set out to write this book, thank you, fantastic question. Um, <laughs> when I set out to write this book, I really wanted it to be something that was accessible in that way. Because I thought we don't really need other scholarly books. The person I had in mind when I was writing this book was like sort of your average Christian layperson who's interested in these topics. 
but hasn't taken biology since high school, or maybe didn't even take biology in high school at all. So I really do try to put it on a pretty low uh, starting point so that you can, so that somebody who's not a science specialist won't feel like you're being overwhelmed. I use that language analogy quite a bit as a way to sort of get people into thinking about how things work. I was talking with a colleague who's actually reviewing the book. Um, uh, he's a, a geneticist, so I didn't expect he would have any trouble with the, the my half of the book. But he said what he did was that he actually gave the book to his nanny, the nanny who looks after his kids, because he knew that he would be able to read the book, and he wanted to see how readable it was for somebody who wasn't a scientist. And she told him that she found the book quite enjoyable and that she understood it. So I was satisfied. Thank you. <laughs> there are some technical sections. There are some sections that are harder, but I try to leave people in the room used more, more gently. So, yeah, my mom and dad read it. They got some of it. So I'm sure that I'll Thank you. Great question. Okay, I think we're going to have to call. Uh, uh, formal end to our time. Let's thank Dr. Benham for his